Hello, good afternoon. My name is Phil Lemus. I'm curator at TBA 21 and TBA 21 Academy. And it's my pleasure to be joined here today by Marcus Riemann, director of TBA 21 and TBA 21 Academy, as well as Lorenzo Sandoval, um, an artist and researcher whom we've commissioned um, at a teaser, an essayistic teaser for uh, a feature film that is currently in development. And that was released last October, 2022, on TBA 21 on stage. Uh, the title of the film, Aquel Verano de 22, The Laws, Las Leyes, so that summer of 2022, um, is really the initial, um, or it traces the initial trajectory of a critical poetic approach to the ecological degradation uh, in the Mar Menor. The Mar Menor is Europe's largest salted lagoon. Um, and recently, at the end of September of 2022, it was granted uh, legal personhood, establishing, effectively establishing a precedent uh, in lawmaking for the rights of nature in uh, the European continent. Um, we're looking at, um, through the Mar Menor and through its ecological degradation, we're looking at the larger ecosystem and really thinking through the mental, spiritual, uh, social ecologies of that region. We're talking about the southeast of Spain, uh, particularly the region of Murcia. And the film traces three locations, La Union, called uh, the New California of southern Spain, uh, the region of the Mar Menor, and also um, the Campo de Cartagena. So through the film and through this conversation today, we're going to dive into the different ways that embodiment, territory, body, landscape, voice, uh, speaking, coming to voice, might give us, through an artistic approach, through artistic research, uh, might give us uh, a lens through which to understand the current debates around uh, the rights of nature. Uh, with that being said, I would love to start by addressing the question of Flamenco, which is um, one of the guiding threads of, um, of the film. Um, and I would like to refer to flamenco as a kind of, uh, in, this, in this teaser, as uh, an expression of environmental grief. Um, the Cante de Mina, so the minor songs, and the Quejillo, um, a subgenre uh, which literally uh, refers to lament, um, are considered, you know, part of the canon of, of, of flamenco, um, but we could we could also look at them as forms of mourning for the social body, which is exploited, uh, depleted, and exhausted by the same capitalist modes of production um, that um, destroy the landscape. And the landscape, in turn, appears in the film not only as a continuation of that human social body, but also. Uh, as inextricably linked to the working class, to working class consciousness, uh, and inextricably linked to a common shared humanity. Um, so with that, uh, I would love, uh, Lorenzo, if you could introduce us to how the miners' song um, and this sonic approach to flamenco in La Union, in the New California, um, connects to uh, the um, value generated by mining in, uh, in the other locations of the film, La Manga, Mar Menor, um, and how do you connect the kind of these three extractivist processes through sort of a communion, so, sort of a, one kind of a cosmovision. Thank you. I'm very happy to, to be here with you, and I would like once uh, more time to thank you uh, for the opportunity like, to develop this uh, project. I think like the flamenco, uh, there it's like a very specific genre that it's the cante minera, uh, which um, started in in La Unión precisely like at the beginning of the 19th century, or 20th century, sorry. And the um, it's uh, that style it's actually not very cheerful. Uh, it's like uh, um, as many other palos styles. Uh, this one is precisely. Uh, um, 
transmitting like the painful conditions like the miners had. Like, so in order to develop all this economy based uh, mining, uh, like there were like the necessity of um, producing extractivist processes bo- both towards the landscape and towards the, the people who were working there which at the time they were mainly migrants uh, coming from many places from Andalusia, like in processes of inner migration. Uh, with this inner migration, the Flamenco also came into La Union, and uh, because of the conditions there, they developed this very specific style, which uh, the most important at the time. In the beginning, it was uh, a cantaor uh, singer called Rojo el Alpargatero, who vastly he was a uh, uh, cantaor, a singer, and he was uh, always listening to the miners, like what they were singing, like coming back from the work uh, in the in the tavernas, no. And he he started to to develop this um, singing with them, like harder, so to say. The regions in which the the mining was happening and the flamenco, uh, it's the all all like the three parts I'm working with. It's like all the same region, so to say. Because it's like it's a triangle in Murcia in south uh, southeast Spain called Campo de Cartagena, and in the Campo de Cartagena you find uh, the mountains, like it's where the mines are, that it's La Sierra de la Unión. Then you have La Manga, that it's the other part that it's like a branch of uh, land, a strip of land, and the third one, which is the the surroundings of uh, Mar Menor. No? For me, it was shocking when I started to, to look at this region uh, in 2018, like like thinking about this this project at the beginning. Because a friend uh, from Chile, Rodolfo Daur, asked me like to start to think something, which uh, so far like uh, this project didn't happen yet. Uh, but we, uh, it's the way I was starting to to look at uh, this area, and I got very interested in the mining area, which is also this like the Calblanque Natural Park, and in the Calblanque Natural Park you find all these like these uh, different holes, and for me it was striking like to to look at them when I was like going there very often. And I'm, I'm from this region, so when I was going there, like I was always like shocked uh, these mines were there, but in the school, for example, we didn't learn about them, but it was very very strange, no. And when I started to, to, to research about it, uh, what I found, uh, very soon, it's like, it's, uh, produced, uh, this huge, uh, ecological impact, both, uh, in all the area of the mountains with this natural park, uh, by the beach is, uh, place, but also mainly, uh, in a place called Porman. In Porman, it's like from the forties, fifties on with the Rotsi family. It's the place like all the mineral waste was thrown uh, to the site bay. And until today, it's like highly polluted. So then you can see like how the, the miners would express something that actually the nature could be also expressing, but it was like the hard uh, living conditions uh, that uh, this kind of uh, situation with the mining produced. Uh, when I was doing this research, what happened also, it's like, uh, the processes of anoxia. Anoxia, it's the, the lack of oxy- oxygen in the water because of the eutrophization. Eutrophization, it's like when there is like a massive growing of seaweed. So like the, they consume all the oxygen and the other species, they, they don't have it. Uh, so when I was doing this research, then I found uh, this anoxia to be like quite connected to the, to the mining process. So, what I realized it was that there is like a, a negative co- cosmovision, so to say. There's a way of thinking about nature, to living with nature, that it was very much based on exploitation. And that's also how the part of La Manga got included, no? La Manga it was like this like kind of paradise, this strip of land that you would have two seas, like the Salty Lacune and the Mediterranean or Mar Mayor, as we call it there. You have the Mar Menor and the Mar Mayor uh, in this kind of very little line. So they're like what um, what happened there. It's like uh, a guy called Tomas Maestre using money from the mining started to to plan all this strip of land as what it was called um, a new Miami, so to say. So we had the new California, and with La Manga we have a kind of new Miami uh, using also like a cinema to promote it and so on. 
so there, like you have in the, in, in this area that it's only a few kilometers, uh, square kilometers, uh, you have all both together, uh, and interconnected to the movements of capital, mining, construction, and agro-industry. And all, all of them very aggressive towards the people and the landscape. So kind of the, the research, uh, for me was like to try to understand uh, the question, no, that I was like posing. It's like to try to, to understand why these like three aggressive processes, they were allowed and some push to, to happen, no? And also then how, like many of them, for example, as I was saying, like in the school, we wouldn't learn about this. But then, like, you have, like, this kind of writing of history, uh, into the flamenco. So you have one part that it's quite interesting, uh, that it's the expression of the pain of the working conditions you have, uh, but also, like, the writing of histories that they were not written. Maybe to follow up on, uh, on exactly that, no, as we're currently, or as we've entered into a new, at least legal reality. And then we're going to, we're going to speak later about this more, no, um, of the region and especially, um, a protection of an ecosystem through a legal framework. Um, do you see that there is a possibility of actually creating a new, um, version of the flamenco that is has a more positive outlook and inscribes itself into a future history um to come yeah i think it's possible and that's something actually already in the 70s people were talking about there is like this very beautiful series called rito y geografia de cante right and geography of uh the cante uh which is like hundred something chapters about flamenco there is one specifically uh dedicated to la union uh, it was made in the 70s. And actually, they bring this question, like, does it make sense to, to sing like uh, like the Mineras like today, no? Because actually, they're talking about the past. And of course, there, I think like there are like few movements in flamenco as in many other disciplines. Like there is like the purist, like they want to keep always the same lyrics uh, and, the, and the same styles without changing it much. Which I find it that it's very important to do so also, because those, we have the lyrics kept because there were people doing that. Like there were like flamenco scholars, uh, and when I say scholars, it's, I'm thinking of singers and musicians in that case. Uh, like they kept alive the tradition, which is so important today. And on the other hand, there were like, uh, many people like, uh, bringing like new, new ways of um, understanding uh, flamenco, no? Like for example, like we can think of Enrico Morente, like he was like introducing many new, many new elements and even doing music with Sonic Youth, no? So I think like also like the, the interesting side to, to things in between, no? Like uh, the, the, as any music or as any cultural um, enterprise, the the interesting part is when when the when the producer are alive and can keep the the memory at the same time. With alive, I mean it's like organicity and it's uh, and there is also porosity, no? Because, yeah, for me, like it's very hard to think about uh, culture in in enclosed ways. Uh, so I think that when it's more powerful culture, it's when it's open to to integrate other things. Also, like in terms of identity, for instance, uh, sometimes it's uh, good to, to think in this way, no? Like, how can we keep uh, an identity with all its difference, like with all, all these particularities, and at the same time, like the identity can can be open to to other things, no? And I think that the, that's also why there is like now a huge movement uh, with flamenco uh, and many other styles of music. Like I think that people start to think differently um, about these questions, and also like I think it's important because if um, one of the problems we have with historical writing is the dividing everything by taxonomies, uh, we need to go beyond taxonomies. By go beyond taxonomies means that we have to uh, break some borders. And when I say borders, I, I say it with all the implications that has. So that raises a very um, beautiful question around the epistemological shift that is necessary to start to consider a legal framework that protects an entire ecosystem rather than a single body, uh, single, a single resource. 
um, and outside the framework, the legal framework that has built itself on the legal, pardon, on the on the liberal um, legal rights holder property white notion of the self, right? And that figure of men that has led to the first uh, separation, violent separation from and against nature. So that epistemological shift is something that is very present in your work, in this work in particular, but in other works that you have uh, done before in sort of runs through your body of work, particularly around the question of language, the question of rhythm, and the question of mutual aid, which I think underlie very much this reading of flamenco that you are um, sharing with us now. So while the film has flamenco as an instrument of reading, and writing history. The film is not about flamenco, of course. And I was wondering if we could touch on the question of language and touch on the question of the epistemological shift that is necessary to understand the landscape and the ecosystem as an extension of ourselves. I would like to mention also like uh, one of the musical reference we're working with, it's like the legacy of Julio Iglesias, uh, which I think also it's interesting to, to think how you can use uh, this kind of uh, symbols also and, and music process in the time it was called uh, Cancion Ligera, which also like they carry like uh, very precise visions of the of the world, no? Like the way not only the music itself, but also uh, in the channels that it was distributed and the reasons why it was distributed. Uh, in that case, it was like to actually uh, epistemologically be possible to destroy La Manga with through the buildings. So like one of the things they did in, it's, uh, in this uh, movie that he was part of in the movie, like the manga still appears like, uh, like as a, this, uh, paradise, uh, with no buildings almost. Uh, and through the music and the film, it was used to, to do this kind of, uh, promotion. I mentioned this because also we would tend to think music is used, uh, in a certain positive ways always. Uh, but, uh, there's like some elements, uh, like they have to be considered also as well of certain types of very subtle propaganda, no? Like, and, and it's done through, through sounds and music as well. So, so also in, in that sense, like when we are switch, switching, uh, the notion of, um, epistemology, like it's good to, to think with, uh, with also like sometimes negative epistemologies as well, no? In the case of, uh, this music very much ascribed to the dictatorial regime and the promotion of these like, uh, massive pro projects that cover like, the whole uh, periphery of the peninsula with buildings, basically. And La Manga was one of the first ones of them. Coming back to more precisely uh, to, to the question you're asking, like, for me, it's quite important to, to try to understand uh, which kind of uh, processes uh, like they are already there like uh, can give us another kind of positions to, to be in the world, no? Uh, one of the histories I still like to, 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 to be spread from Murcia, it's like the, one of the main uh, philosophers of Sufism, Ibn Arabi, uh, that he was born there. And it, uh, like the, the Muslim history and specifically Sufism, it has had like a huge uh, presence in the region as well. I think it's quite important like, to try to, to see the traces of these historiographies that they were already there, to try to, to understand uh, which other models we can find already in place to uh, counter narrate uh, the negative epistemologies of extractivism. In Sufism, uh, poetry and sound, they are fundamental. No? And I think there is like a long subterranean tradition that uh, connects many elements, uh, like could bring actually these possibilities. So when we think about the, the, how everything is connected in the, in the book of the world, as, uh, even Arabi would post, uh, that actually giving, uh, us very interesting keys, uh, to understand the connections of between, uh, nature and culture, which the, the taxonomical projects of the combination of law, uh, science and capitalism was working against. Like taxonomies, they work towards separation. And we have these other philosophies that operate towards understanding the connections. And I think that's something like, would it be interesting to, 
to think uh, that it's actually how can we uh, understand the continuities among things and not only the fractures. Because for, for very long, when we think, I don't know, like, for example, with Foucault or the less on all these things because we, we, we like a lot and they give us many tools. They constantly talk about the fracture, the, the cut, you know, all these elements. But, uh, that somehow, uh, we could consider that it still belongs to, to the more modern way of understanding, uh, epistemologies. So it's good to, to try to move towards, uh, other models that are already in place, which give us different tools. Maybe staying with epistemologies for, for a second and speaking concretely about the film, no, because it comes to us, um, somehow under the guise, uh, of a documentary, no, or at least it lends some aspects of documentary, um, uh, filmmaking. Um, but, uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about how you've constructed the different layers of the film, especially under this aspect of how things connect, how they flow into each other, how the seepages of one into the next. For me, it's quite uh, challenging because it's the first time I'm working in this way. Like uh, the, the previous films I've made, it's more always with uh, a lot of material that it's archival material, like creating this uh, through montage, like connections and so on. And, and in this case, uh, something I want to put together is like people are speaking in interviews, so to say, uh, but also nature speaking. So, and, uh, to try to find out how can we do like a choral portrait of the area? Uh, but like some of the characters are also like the parts of the landscape, no? Or how can we <laughs> understand what the sea is saying? Or actually, does it speak with words? If uh, C doesn't speak with words, how is the speaking and how can we establish a communication? No, uh, those, those questions, uh, they are very fundamental. It's, I don't think I have uh, answers, but I'm doing attempts. No, like I'm, I'm trying to go there with the equipment, with the cameras, with the mics, uh, with the presence, with the, with the, with the skin. Like I'm trying to, activate all the possible sensors I can find to, to produce these kind of things. And in the sense, like, uh, thinking about documentary, uh, for me, it's quite useful, like, to, uh, to think from this uh, notion, the people from forensic architecture has been working, uh, in terms of, uh, forensics. Uh, yeah, Weissman talks about the idea of the sensor, no? And I, I think, like, this notion of the sensor could be expanded also, like, towards these documentary practices, no? Like, the landscape, like, a mountain, like, when you see, like, the sparse in the mountain, uh, that's a system of, uh, writing, one can think. But then we have to think writing as a, in a very expanded, uh, way. So then, like, again, Sufism, it's quite useful there, because, like, uh, what it says in Sufism, it's like the world, it's a book of science for those who, who are to read. And the science, it's not necessarily a spoken language or written language. Like the, like the science actually, it's like a, it has to do also, uh, Sophia was mentioning before, that like with the notion of reading, uh, which uh, Henry Lefebvre in reading analysis talked very beautifully about it. He proposed Two ways of understanding reading. One is circular and the other one is linear. The linear, the linear one would more or less refer to a, a um, idea of time that it's progressive, uh, and it uh, would define the time of capitalism. The cyclical time, it's the one related to, to the, to the heartbeats or to the movements of the planets or, or the cycles in nature in general. And of course, this is interesting to think up about it and then be like, uh, be very aware that actually there are like many times they overlap and they, like one thing can be two things at the same time. No? Uh, but, but yeah, I think like, uh, like to expand the notion of uh, what it means like, to, to do documentary, it's also like to try to transfer the agency of, uh, of the people who we are producing the film. So what's actually the the other sites we can read these sites? Uh, these sites could be the body of some people, gestures of someone preparing a concert, uh, like a peace and man in the morning, like getting the 
uh, the fish out of the Mar Menor, or even like the foam, like in the Mar Menor, you can find because of the contamination. No? So the Mar Menor is sending these uh, messages. And it's, yeah, I would think like the Mar Menor is then somehow also like writing something when, when it does uh, this. No? Going from the question of uh, place-based knowledge and um, how you relate to that place that has uh, that you have a specific familial connection with, um, but there's also a transhistorical, transtemporal connection that you're reading through the land through the landscape. You mentioned specifically the period of Islamic Spain and the history of uh, a certain tradition of mystical thinking, particularly in relation to to Islam and to Sufi Islam, particularly with with uh, Ibn Arabi as being uh, a, a sage, a philosopher, a, a poet from the region, from Murcia, where you grew up. I was wondering if we could speak a little bit about something that you have repeatedly told me, uh, which is this expression of the Marmenor as an oracle. So since we're looking more broadly into mystical and sort of um, prophetic knowledge, could you expand on this? Like the question of thinking about the landscape uh, and precisely the Marmenor as an oracle, like in the practice, it comes from, from two particular points. The one point it has to do um more like with uh, scientific knowledge so to say uh, like talking with people from ecologistas in action or, or reading like some different um references or even talking with teresa vicente and it has to do like how we can understand mal menor as being as most uh, like you salty like you uh, as in advance of what it's going to happen in a major scale in the in the Mediterranean and in all the seas, no, with the rising of temperatures and 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 so on. So the Mar Menor, in that sense, acts as an anticipation of what is going to happen in in other places, no. In, in the other hand, uh, the reason why I think of the Mar Menor as an oracle, it's to try to put it in a in a long term tradition. Like in many mystical knowledges, like Buddha appear, no? like in the Bible, you would have, for example, like one plant that is speaking, or like in 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 the Greek tradition, uh, for example, like the like the sea would be a god, and the mountains, like they would be another god, no, like Atlas, and those, I mean, even the anthropomorphized, like they would have also uh, these agencies, no, like it, that the nature is speaking at the end of the day, or like the Pachamama also in in South America, in Avellala. So yeah, I think like it's, it's tried to connect these kind of two elements, no? Like how it does in a very concrete way anticipate, uh, what is coming. And in the other sense, it's also like, uh, telling us how some keys of how to understand the connections between, um, agency and nature. And maybe very concretely about the, the, um, the legal shift, uh, or the legal turn that has happened specifically in the Mamenor now, but is, um, uh, as the, as the first site in Europe that has been, uh, awarded somehow personhood rights. No. Um, but it seems to be a series of sites that are, um, that are going to come. No. So maybe you can talk a little bit about that and your involvement in it and, and, um, where you see this going. Um, where the, again, maybe the Mamenor acts as an oracle or, or, um, an affirmation for the future. Affiliation with, uh, with what happened with the Mamenor, it was very visceral. I mean, I grew up going every summer there. My mother, uh, grew up in the Mamenor. So like once of the project of, uh, collecting signatures, uh, for making this, uh, ELP, this, uh, movements for getting a law. Uh, happening that it was granting, um, like a legal persona to the Marmenor to have, like, rights. Of course, like, the reaction was, like, to join and to try to collect as many signatures as I could. Like, I became a, uh, federatario, so it's like a representative, like, collecting signatures. And I would, uh, start to organize people in, in Murcia, Valencia, and here, like, as much as I could. From, from Berlin, which was a little bit more complicated, but I got involved as much as I could, no? Uh, which I think it, it was important. And, and that was somehow my, my entry point to, to get in contact with, uh, with the organization, no? Which I thought that they were doing like such a fantastic work. So actually from a very humble position, I would try to, to help as much as I could. 
and also the the film and the whole project uh still it's like uh going in that direction no it's like the like what i can do like to promote the rights of nature it's like a big part of the film no like it's like uh, i mean it's in one hand it tries to tell the story of this extractivism uh, but in the other hand uh, it's quite important for me no like to see what people are doing like what are the movements it's only like to think about proactive positions not only like the criticism but how like people are organizing themselves i'm trying to create also like a subterranean historical connections for example like anarchism uh it was one of the or socialism it was one of the organizations that they were like uh implemented by the workers uh, to try to improve the conditions uh and of course like this idea of mutual aid uh it's like a fundamental in the history of uh, anarchism and, and socialism no so for me it's, i see a connection uh between what the miners were doing and the people who who we've been doing uh with with the miners or no it's like organizing ourselves or to try to get uh better conditions and also like as uh climate change develops more and more uh like the issues related to environments uh they are more present of course at the time uh in the, there were particular occasions that the like the people were facing uh or were thinking like towards landscape but it was not uh, the same conversation no but for example there is something quite interesting to think about but it's the question of breathing no and the question of breathing it's present in, in few places that when looking at the at the PC stories like I mean, of course with the flamenco something that it's there like the breathing is fundamental for the singing but the way of they were singing actually it was developed in this very particular way because the tones the miners could do it was like very limited that's why like uh mineras it's like such a different such a difficult palo because like it's like the tones you can use it's are very limited it's a very mid tones and this was coming precisely because of the silicosis like the like the the miners they were not able to breathe because they have minerals in the lungs so we have, we have to really understand the, this aggression here and again uh, this is something like to we can think another negative uh, position but it is that's also like a continuity between the landscape and the body so like one side the minerals are implemented in the lungs of the miners you have the mountain inside of the miner that's the uh, capitalist and then a liberal cosmovision what produces and of course then like this question of breathing it appears again in the anoxia in the marmenor when the marmenor it's lacking like oxygen and more than 95% of the species of the of the marmenor uh, die it's because they can't breathe and the another striking thing for this uh, agro industry to happen it's fundamental the the structural racism to be happening at the same time the processes of anoxia were happening it was the whole movement of with George Floyd of uh, black lives matter of i can't breathe and this type of structural racism it what allows like so many people to work in these like uh conditions in some cases uh close to enslavement actually as it has been defined in the near area in, in almeria but also uh there and also like with uh, almost no rights no so i think like uh the question of breathing uh it's also the fundamental no perhaps just as a closing question uh and i love that you have made this jump and this continuity between human and natural rights and um opened up a sort of uh, a larger broader question around what would be a critical approach to the rights of nature and what can art contribute to that reading um maybe just as a um, as a way of bringing together all of our perspectives i was wondering marcus if you want to say something about the work that the academy is also uh conducting in this direction how uh, lorenzo's work has also been involved in other initiatives of tba21 academy and how this teaser of this film lorenzo this one is for you um what we showed here in stage is really a teaser of a larger uh film to come 
So I was wondering how these different elements of activism, law, environment, artistic practice come together in this meeting of, of the three of us. I think there's a, there's a number of things. No, uh, going back to the question of language and and uh, the implications of language. No, uh, to pass on personhood rights on an ecosystem in this moment that we're in, where um, we're still struggling with the definition of climate change, climate breakdown, climate catastrophe, wherever you sit on that spectrum. No, but um, but I think what comes along with it very often is the notion of stopping it. No, and uh, and so passing personhood rights onto an ecosystem um, is very often equated with this is an effort to stop climate change. No, at uh, at the same time we're we're experiencing in the south of Spain a tremendous heat wave, right? So there is there is no such thing of of stopping anything because there's already so much uh, um, carbon locked in the atmosphere that uh, processes have set have been set uh, into motion that. Stopping is is definitely not the right thing or, or or the right word to think about. No, and I think here again, uh, the south of Spain, the Mameno Murcia, is uh, is uh, is feeling the effects of that locked in energy. No, uh, we already had in Murcia and in in Andalusia in April uh, thirty eight plus degrees. No, it's like uh, that's that's uh, just. Going back to this idea of language and 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 um, the ideas that are attached to these languages and how art actually can embrace these complexities and and break open these uh, these ideas and develop other um, maybe more complicated complex uh, uh, thoughts around this. No, I think that's super important and uh, and the efforts uh, that are made in this work. No, to to somehow even mediated through um, through a film. Right to to um, to try to understand what is the voice of the mountain, the sea, the foam, and so on. No, and and to see how we can actually place this into um, into an artistic work. No, I think that's that's super important and that's very very closely aligned to us. I think also at the same time as we started this work together, we also started an internal research project specifically around the the legal personal rights of ecosystems um and that's a that's a beginning and and obviously working together with uh, Lorenzo and thinking with all of the collaborators involved you no know, has has fed a lot of information into practical information into into that research project and uh, simultaneously we're looking at um at the notion of or an idea um that is called convivial conservation which is exactly moving away from this idea of fortress conservation no uh, nature versus humans or humans versus nature um and and all the challenges that come with that no if we think about the park system um in many african nations but also all across the world who actually profits from these uh, from these parks how um is how our communities uh, that have been living in or are close to these ecosystems how have they been moved away moved off and how how do they um economically benefit or not benefit uh, from these notions no and so so um the idea of convivial conservation of being together is tackling exactly exactly these questions uh, how do we how do we um again tear down this divide between nature and human how do we think that uh, us as part of it how do we uh, reorganize the economics around this no so that that it is uh, it's um it's more equitable that conservation becomes not exclusionary or exclusive or uh, a form of um green colonialism no but but becomes more equitable more inclusive um, and more community uh, driven. No, I think, and so there, there are many points that relate. There are many ideas that are, have been triggered uh, through this work, and um, there are many intersecting um, initiatives that uh, that come up and and um, come up uh, repeatedly. So I I foresee this is going to be uh, a long and beautiful continued conversation uh, with Lorenzo and all of the all of the collaborators. I would like to add uh, one more thing with uh, Marcus, what you were saying, and Sophie also was uh, introducing before, which has to do uh, with how the movements of the rights of nature, so 
something that is quite important. It's not only like the environments they get direct rights. So like could be like groups of people that it's not only the government, uh, which can change, uh, the ones are getting to fight for the rights. Uh, but I think the most important element, and this is something Teresa speaks often, it's actually that in the change of conscious, uh, it's the long term, uh, relation with nature. It's not only in the precise cases, uh, like to, uh, to improve, uh, the conditions, but it's actually how we have a new, uh, relation with nature. So if before we had that something Michelle Serres also in the natural contract was talking about. If before like the, we had the social contract as a point zero for everyone to understand uh, the rights of everyone, but it was missing in this um, social contract. It was precisely uh, one more partner with this nature, the environment, no? And this has to do because nature was only understood as a background or as a resources to be exploited. And with, of course, no agency and the big change with the rights of nature movement is precisely to, uh, put one seat in the table, uh, to the agency of the environment. This is, um, this is not a unique European thing. No, it is, uh, we're, we're the last to, to, uh, to the table. And, um, and I guess for in this situation, we, the divide between, um, humans and nature or the kind of the utilitarian um and extractive relationship that we have is so massive no that it seems that the law is the only um the the only tool or one of very few tools but the most powerful tool to actually force us to reconsider this relationship right and uh, and um that's that's tremendously sad actually one thing like now I've been showing the DSA in, in many different situations, like, uh, and there's like a question that uh, always come up, uh, in the conversations that it, it's, uh, the relate, the relation with religion, which is also something very interesting because Michelle Serres talks about it. Juan Carlos Blanco from Ecologistas en Acción also was talking about it and Teresa Vicente, uh, as well. So I think like this, uh, question, it's quite interesting, like how we can think beyond religion or together with religion, uh, also like to try to create some notions of the sacred, no? That like it's, uh, I'm thinking about this because there's something beyond law. It's a kind of like a relation that it's of, uh, mystical nature, no? Like, uh, which is actually rationality or legality. It can't grant. And I think this is a beautiful conclusion. Uh, uh, the work that Marcus and I and the whole team at TVA21 Academy have been generating is precisely towards inviting artistic practice that looks at interchange uh, as the possibility or, or creating the conditions for possibility for social change. So um, there's a lot in this conversation we didn't get to. Um, there's some really interesting aspects about how the um, audiovisual industry connects with this sort of market-oriented value-generating economies that uh, Lorenzo is working with from mining to real estate to agribusiness. Uh, there's really interesting uh, thinking that goes into uh, the self-organizing, the anarchist and the mutual aid and uh, networks of solidarity uh, and how these uh, different forms of exploring politics within the social body work through from, uh, Lorenzo's practice. Uh, these two points, for example, can are very visible or hearable in this case in the podcast that Lorenzo has done with Carolina Jimenez. It is a podcast in Spanish language. For those of you who are Spanish speakers, I very much invite you to listen to this. It's a very valuable source of information. And in addition to this, there's also the, the Zoom conversations or recordings of Zoom conversations that Lorenzo has contributed to as part of Ocean Uni. Uh, another initiative from TVA21 Academy. These are available online, free to consult in oceanarchive.org. Uh, so please do feel free to consult. There's going to be links uh, also with, to this uh, video on stage. There's a wealth of material on the Mar Menor that we're gathering uh, along with other partners outside and within Spain and Europe. And I invite you to stay on for the conversation and for continuing uh, to see this relationship developing.
Thank you so much. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you, Lorenzo. Thank you, Sofia. Thank you, Thanks again for having these very enriching conversations and for the support. <laughs> Oh, my God.